mean no. Okay, okay. Welcome back. We are now on episode number six of the From the Fabricator podcast. I'm Max Perlstein. Thank you so much for coming back once again. Uh, having a lot of fun with this. And today uh, on this this po podcast, great guests. Um, not that I haven't had them before because I've been very, very blessed, but really enjoyed these three people. Uh, a fun one uh, for sure. And a lot, a lot of insight, interesting takes uh, throughout this thing uh, that I think you'll enjoy. So that is coming up in a little bit. Uh, but before we get into the guests, uh, some quick thoughts right off the top. And the biggest thing is the glass shortage. Something that I've talked about a few times, I've blogged about, it is here. Uh, and uh, hopefully not getting much worse, but it sure seems like it's headed in the wrong direction. Um, there's been some spot outages in, in bigger cities, uh, people scrambling to find glass. Uh, there are definitely some concerns. Uh, there have been talks of some allocation aspects. Uh, this is a tough one. And, uh, and, and the biggest key that I have to keep talking about is you've got to be communicating up and down that supply chain. You've got to communicate with your suppliers and you've got to communicate with your customers and let them know what's going on uh, because this thing is real and it is an issue and you have to you know, communicate your way. I don't want to say out of it, but communicate your way through it uh, because uh, there's no uh, you know, glass genie. I wish there was one where we could snap our fingers and uh, all of a sudden, a ton of six mil clear uh, arrives on your dock. Uh, we are definitely up against it right now. Hopefully, going to get a little bit better. Uh, there are some uh, there are some rumors out there that could make it a lot worse for uh, on the commercial side, especially for uh, smaller fabricators. So that's uh, one to be concerned with uh, if it happens. But right now, that's just in the rumor mode. Uh, but at the end of the day, this glass shortage uh, is something that you have to. Keep in mind and uh, be as proactive as you can. Uh, and that's the big thing uh, right now, the glass shortage. Uh, communicate, communicate, communicate. Also, the big thing right now, and you know it's uh, close to my heart, and we're going to talk about it with Andrew Herring later on in this podcast, is Glass Build America. Registration is now open, uh, and let's do this thing, folks. Uh, you know, people are getting there. Uh, in Registration-wise, it's starting to... Uh, you know, get a little bit of action. We've got a long time until September, but go ahead. You know, you're coming, get booked now. And the reason I say get booked now is a, you want the hotel, you want the better hotels and B the flight prices may change uh, with, with, again, with cost of, 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 of fuel uh, supply chain issues that we're talking about. Uh, look for that price. Now it uh, will probably be a better price now than it'll be in the fall. I'm not sure, uh, but better safe than sorry. So get signed up. Uh, and, and the big reason to go is, is just what I talked about, that supply chain, uh, the communication of it. You're doing yourself a massive disservice if you're not at this show uh, this year uh, to get in front of people for the first time in 18 months or more uh, and to be able to hash things out face to face and to find out what's coming down the pike and to find out how you can deal with certain things. This is it. This is a great opportunity. September in Atlanta, Glass Build America. Go to glassbuild.com right now and register. Uh, and if you need a uh, registration code, hit, hit me up. Uh, you know, they're all over online. You should be following your suppliers. Your supplier should be able to give you one. Come on, come on, you could do this or, or get with me. I will get you in there uh, and, and we will go from there. But, uh, and Andrew may give out a code. Uh, you know what? He may give out a code on this podcast. So you have to listen to his segment. All right. So coming up, three great guests, uh, starting off with Dr. Kayla Natividad of NSG Pilkington. Uh, Mind-blowing. Great, great person. Interesting person. Insights like you wouldn't believe. And uh, I just like the way uh, she operates. I think there's uh, so much there. Uh, and then Omar Malouf of Momentum Glass out of Texas. Uh, they also have locations uh, in other parts of the country. 
this this one was really interesting to me because he showed a project that was truly blood, sweat, and tears of him and his people, uh, and and there was meaning behind this project. Uh, he also covered a lot of different things like core values and team. Also got a little trash talk in on uh, Texas Austin University of Texas Longhorns and, and Gigum Aggies. You, you want to stay tuned for that. And then uh, wrapping it up, Andrew Herring, my main man from the National Glass Association, one of the most talented humans. Uh, in our world, uh, just a great, great guy, and um, just neat to finally get to chop it up with him on here. And then I wrap it up with some fun stuff. It's back three TV shows or documentaries or uh, specials to watch all on one channel, and that's coming up at the end of this podcast. But let's get things going now. Let's kick it off with Dr. Kayla Navitadad. I knew I was going to screw that up somewhere along the way. Uh, from NSG Pilkington, here she is. All right, so now I'm very, very excited. This is somebody I've not met in person yet, so this is the first time I'm actually getting to talk to her and and meet over Zoom and on this podcast. And it is Dr. Kayla Natividad or Natividad. I told her before we started I was going to screw up her last name. I hope I didn't. Did. Uh, awesome. She's from <laughs> NSG Pilkington, Pilkington, North America. Thank you so much for being on the podcast, Kayla. No, thank you for having me. I'm a huge fan of the blog and podcast, so I was honored that you asked me to be part of it. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, uh, Kayla is the Architectural Services Technical, uh, a Architectural Services Technical Engineer at uh, NSG Pilkington, and she's very involved in our industry and, and has been you know, for, for a little while, and she's been on my radar. I will tell you, it goes back to I used to do a uh, an interview series on the blog in the summers because summers are kind of slow. It's like question and answer. And I had identified you a couple of years ago. So I, I'd really like to get to know this this person because I kept seeing your name in all of the different committees and with with NGA and and, and out there. Uh, so so you, you know you struck me as this this sharp, young, focused, you know you know driving sort of person, which we, we're kind of we don't have a lot of you out in our world. So that's what it was like. I I really want to meet you so i'm glad i've got this opportunity and thanks for coming on here thank you um so let's start with your background uh you know i did a little bit of digging uh and there's a you know the texas tech factor is is pretty strong with you you were there for for quite a while um and, and so but before we talk about texas yeah, tech nice there you go red raiders yes so before we talk about lubbock and texas tech my, my question is is growing up where did you grow up and 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 you know, you're, you're a doctor, you're a PhD now. Was this all in the plan? Were you one of those, uh, you know, five-year-old girls who were like, yep, I'm going to be a doctor. I'm going to work in the glass business in 25 years. I mean, wh what was the plan there? Yeah, not at all. Um, so I was born and raised in West Texas and like not Lubbock, Panhandle, Texas, like really West Texas. So um, it's a small town named, it's called Pecos, Texas. Okay. I don't know if you're familiar, um, but think um odessa midland area okay like we're friday night lights friday night lights but further yeah. west further so west okay uh disputably home of the world's first rodeo so okay. it was very small ten thousand people okay uh, yeah and so my family is one of the founding families of our like the pioneer families of the town nice uh and just surrounded by family all the time and so um yeah I, I think early on I knew I wanted like whatever I decided I wanted to do I didn't know what I wanted but uh I was going to be like an expert at it or like the best at it right nice. um just if I if it was something I could know I, I've always been like addicted to education okay uh and so yeah I just didn't necessarily think it was a PhD um okay. but it, but I just wanted to be good at whatever it was. And so um, growing up, I had like a fascination with buildings and bridges and just city planning in general. And so I thought I wanted to be an architect for a long time. Okay. And I went to Texas Tech for architecture initially, okay. uh, but but not, not, not ever thinking PhD. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Yeah. And, 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 and I mean, I, so, so, and I'm glad you ended up on our side of the ball than, than the architecture side of the ball. And so that, that's good. And, and so, so you, you did go through Texas tech and you got everything, all of your, 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 uh, you know, college career is from Texas tech, correct? Or did I read that wrong? You've, you've got it all. No, that's, the... 
that's it. Yeah. So I, I started out in architecture and uh, decided I didn't want to do that halfway through my first semester. Uh, and then I went advertising oh, wow. and realized I didn't want to do that. And then I got into civil engineering from there. And yeah, I uh, met who I like Dr. Norville and Dr. Morse, who I later got my uh, master's and PhD under. And I don't know, I just got hooked on glass from there. Yeah. Cause uh, you're talking about Stephen Morse, correct? In, in yeah, he's, Stephen he's Morse, Scott Norville. Yeah. yeah and I, I've seen them both speak uh, on, on occasion. So that's the, so that's how they kind of led you into the building products angle was, was hooking up with those guys. Yeah. Um, so I, in my undergrad, I uh, graded papers for Scott Norville. Mm-hmm. And at one point, uh, they both had their like glass testing facility set up, right? And so they're like, hey, do you want to go see something cool? I'm like, yeah. And so we went out and I got to see them explode some, do some tunnel tests and explosions. Yeah. And I was like, we'll get to break things for a living. I want to do that. Like, yeah. so I honestly got into glass because I liked breaking it. <laughs> nice. Nice, nice. I was curious how you got into the window sort of thing, but now that makes a lot of sense. And and uh, now, how did you find your way to way to Pilkington? How, you know, how did how did that end up? Um. Yeah. So, so I started doing research. I guess backing up a little, I started doing uh, glass research with them, and um, I was initially just going to get my bachelor's, and I was ready to sign on with the company and move on. And uh, to my luck. The, the job I thought I was going to get fell through. Okay. Um, and so then, you know, Dr. Uh, Norville was like, hey, you know, why don't you go through? You've already been doing research for me. Stay on a semester. Uh, try out a master's. And if you like it, then we can work something out. So, okay, that sounds good. So once I got accepted in the master's program, he says, oh, also your research got accepted into GPD Finland. Nice. So we're going to Finland. So you have a poster. Oh, great. And I get there and I realize glass is way more than just like glass strength, right? Um, get it, it's the optical properties of thermal properties, obviously glass strength, just different design mechanisms. And so I was like, this is much like way over my head. I didn't realize glass was so robust. Um, and then from there, I finished my, all of the rest of my papers. Um, but I met um, I don't know if you're familiar with Neil McSporin, uh -huh. yep, yep, who yep. used to be the business development for NSGI. So I met him through a lot of these like meetings and conferences that I started going to. Yeah. Um, and yeah, he, as I was wrapping up my PhD, uh, he said, hey, come in for an interview. Let's talk. And it worked out. I, I realized how much I, I had a couple interviews outside of the glass industry, right. uh, but I was so hammered by glass. I was like, no, I'm just going to go here. Like this one makes more sense. So I, I knew there was a reason I liked you and, and you, you, <laughs> you, you picked it up right away. This is very cool with the glass. And, and now you've been with, with NSG Pilkington for five years. It's a legendary brand. It's, you know, you know, obviously one of the first glass, you know, makers yeah. in the world. Um, how, how's that been? I mean, it's, it had to be a pretty neat experience going from, you know, going through the academic, academic side of things and learning now to, to a whole nother side of the, the game on, uh, you know, the commercialization side and also having the technical, you know, chops that you have. How's it been? How's it been? It's been great. Um, I, I love the team, uh, that is here. It's just pr really small, get to know everybody really well. Um, and honestly, just I haven't found my limits yet of how far I can reach out and what I can do with glass and with our customers and trying to, you know, collaborate on everything. I think um, I work really well in a collaborative mindset. And so it's nice that I can just call up somebody and be like, hey, I don't know anything about X, Y, Z. Let's chat for an hour and maybe I can learn something about it that will help me later on. So. I think what I've learned is um, cause in order to really design and like really take everything um, in at the end, you have to kind of know how the beginning of the process starts. And like, if you know all the steps through it it makes your end decisions much easier in my opinion. And so I've just, I'm still learning every day kind of picking brains of like, hey, I don't know anything about how our actual like float process, this section of it Right. Can you 
talk to me about it. And so it's been great. I, I, I love it. <laughs> cool. Cool. And I think that's yeah. what, what, what really f- plays into my next question is that because you're a, you know, a collaborative person, you, you want to, to, to work in, in, in those areas and be able to kind of give and take, you, you've really settled in nicely into the, the NGA committees and the different, uh, you know, ASTM committees and ANSI committees, all these things that I know that you're involved in some, you know, more than others. Um, you know, you, you know, are you feeling like, you know, you know, the collaboration and, and now just a few years into this year, you're making a difference just because I do think that I see that you are, but how do you feel like you are with, with working with a lot of folks who've been in this industry, you know, 30, 40 years? Uh, yeah, I like I like to think I might be, but I don't know. It's hard to see from like my perspective, right? I think um, with the way everything is laid up, and our our I realize our industry is laid up a lot different than most because we have the manufacturer, and then you have to go to maybe multiple fabrication steps, and then your right. actual end use. And um, I think uh, a big part of of really what I like is it, like I said, I love learning and I love maybe helping educate. Um, and even if it doesn't feel like a true, like, oh, here, let me teach you a lesson. It's just those conversations at the meetings, like afterwards when you go out to dinner and like trading that knowledge and information. And uh, I, I, earlier I said, I wanted to be one of the leading, like no matter what I did, I want to be an expert mm-hmm. and I want to know all the things. And I think that's really hard to do with glass because there's so many knowledgeable people that have been here for years. And, you know, I'm, I don't necessarily feel like I'm making a difference because I feel like I'm always playing catch up. Um, but, sure. but I like to think that I am. I like to think that, you know, all of the trade associations and all of the work that's being put out is making a difference on a large scale yeah no no doubt and yeah. i think i think i think you are and i think you're making a difference from the standpoint of you've brought some energy uh you know into into this space and and uh you know i do think you fit very nicely with the the what i would call the legends of like julie Schimmelpenny is a legend i mean she's oh, she is absolutely absolute legend uh sort of person and i think that you know you you, you fit nicely into that world so that that's good and it's good to have you with us on that <laughs> No, no, no doubt. So, so I have to ask because you are a technical, you know, technical person, technical whiz. Uh, and, and I wrote this to you in my outline. I, I have struggled for years with green building rating systems. Ha, 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 you know, first off, have you jumped into it? Because I know you, 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 you handle a lot of different technical aspects. I didn't even know when I wrote and said, I'm going to ask you this question. If you were heavy into green, you know, green rating systems at all, you know, because I know you handle a lot of different things. So first off, are you, do, do you follow these different green rating systems? Are you aware of them, you know, involved and so on? Yeah, I, uh, I have my well AP and okay. I'm, I'm a lead breed associate. So I'm working on my AP right now. And okay. I'm absolutely, I am all for sustainable sustainability sure. sustainable design uh that is that is like my bread and butter right now yeah. honestly so i was like oh maybe he knows that i've been like looking into this a lot <laughs> i i knew that you i knew i knew that passive house and net zero i know you've you've you know been associated where, where i'm struggling mm-hmm. on the and i'm going to ask you about that in a second but the, the green building rating systems is where i suffer because glass just doesn't seem to ever get a uh, a boost you know, we're, we're kind of an afterthought. Why, why is that? Can we ever change that? I mean, what do you think? Yeah. So I think d- depending on which one you look at, um, glass is definitely like prime for a lot of it. Um, when, whenever you look at a lot of the green rating systems, you really think about it and it's, you know, heavy in, um, quality views, heavy in daylighting, um, you know, you have your biophilia, which is your connection to nature and design and things like that. And if you really think about building products, which building products allow that um, from all aspects? And really, it's glass, right? Yeah. I mean, there's yeah. not, there is no other building material like glass. Exactly. Um, and so I think, I think it does lend itself to it, but I think it is, uh, it doesn't necessarily have to call glass out directly because there's nothing else that can do it. Right. Um, and so, so whenever you go through and you look at, um, you know, it's in lead and it's definitely in well, when you start really looking at, um, your, I guess, mental health and human wellness, not necessarily mm-hmm. like the buildings wellness, um, glass is all over it. And right. I, you know, it's, it's something that I think the glass industry has talked about before in passing, but it's, it's always a side thought because 
I don't know, like people look through the glass, they don't think about the glass itself. Right. right? Um, and so unless you're in the glass industry, you're thinking of the actual glass where everyone else is like, no, that's just, of course we're gonna have that in there. So uh, it, it definitely does lend itself to sustainable design and green building. I think it's just a, a given and not necessarily an explicit call out. You know, that's the yeah. best explanation I've heard yet. Uh, so I appreciate that. I, I just have always, um, you're right. I mean, what else are you going to put in that, 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 you know, in, in, in that, you know, in its place, glass is it. But I, I've just always mm-hmm. struggled with the fact that, um, you know, back in the beginnings of lead, when you could get a, uh, a credit for the, the parking space for your bike, uh, or, you know, having an outlet for the electric car, but, Yet we could put in high performance glass or glazing and, and not get anything. But it's it's funny that you say that it's, uh, you know, you have to put our stuff in. So leading into the next question, I think glass is great for passive house and net zero. And I think it's I think it's going to be a, a big, big piece of that because, A, yeah. I do think it lends itself to the energy. But also what you just mentioned about the occupant comfort and the the productivity and the the natural light aspect is huge. It's such a massive difference. Um, do you see that, you know, do you see from your side, a gain in passive house net zero, you know, people starting to really, you know, you know, gear up for that, or is it still way into the niche territory? Yeah. So I think the, the, especially in recent years, it's definitely more capable and I, but I think the, you know, it's always been there. And I, I think I have this discussion a lot with regards to glass technology, um, there is high performance glass. There is, you know, you can get ridiculously great performing glass and uh, glass is always seen as the weakest link. But I think part of that is because it's usually value added out, right? Yes. yes. Um, you know, we've, we've had projects where they go through and they put, you know, re- like really impressive uh, configurations up top. And then when you go to this other area, it's like, oh, we put monolithic clear. And you're like, why would you do that? They're like, they're like oh, you know, because we just needed something there. And so I think, I think when you look at a glass design from like an energy standpoint and, you know, from these net zero passive house, things right. like that, I mean, the technology is there um, and it's just having the end consumer, like the building owner find the, uh, why it's so important, right? Yeah. So for, from that standpoint, I mean, we almost have to stop talking about glass and start talking about, okay, well, what are, if you do this, now let's start talking about the impacts on your mechanical systems. Now let's start talking about the impacts of your uh, lighting systems. Now let's start talking about the impacts that that would have on these other things. Um, and so really to, to promote glass in these aspects, you have to know about everything else. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and so, yeah, I think I agree with you. I think it's there. I think it's it's bound to happen, right? Um, you start looking at now we have VIGs and hybrid VIGs. We have uh, people working on transparent BIPV. Yep. Uh, we, you know, I, I your electrochromic glazing, so you don't have to worry about your shading devices and impacts on your HVAC systems. And I think it's coming. Um, I think it's the the tough part is the adoption from the end consumer and and to help with that it goes back to everything we've been talking about as far as like you just the education and awareness of what's available is like critical i think yeah and and i think the the education is huge but also i i think there is a a level of um uh, of a lack of trust because i do Mm -hmm. see designers and architects and engineers still over design the hvac systems because they don't trust the glass and glazing. And, and that yeah. makes me a little crazy. Oh, it drives me nuts. And so being from Texas in this past, you know, seeing the power issues that just happened over yes. the past winter and, you know, and, you know, there was a lot of devastating news about it. And I think it's because they're relying heavily on your mechanical systems and not on, you know, maybe your glass design and your actual structure design. and um you know there there is a way that it the impacts could have been lessened um if they had designed the actual structure and not relied solely on the hvac or mechanical systems right um Mm -hmm. and and you know i and i think that's also part of sustainable building and sustainable design is 
uh, when you go through and you look at it, you're not looking at it from a every, maybe you don't always look at it from a everything is running ideally. And uh, if it's always a, if this were to happen, how it, oh, well, now you know your fenestration is good enough that you're, you know, you have your fourth surface low E that's keeping your heat in your structure rather than like letting it go out or, right. or op- vice versa, right? You have a really good uh, solar heat gain coefficient. So people are in boiling sitting in their house in the middle of summer when their HVAC goes out. And so I think that's, that's a major part of sustainable design, in my opinion, as well. And, and it just, I think yeah. it, it continues to come down to education. And, and I've had this talk, on, um, I think, almost every month on this podcast about how technical information is so crucial you know, sharing those technical, you know, angles and that, that the people that are designing the buildings and, and being involved, they need to know this technical angle better than they need to know the prettiness or the beauty of the building itself. Um, and, and I think that's, you know, there, there are people out there that are doing a nice job of pushing the technical versus the fluff. And as I joke with Casey Anderson last month, I'm all a fluff guy. I, I, I struggle in the technical because I can't speak correctly like you guys do. But, but uh, you, we need more technical than the fluff be, to get these messages out for sure. For sure. Yeah. I, so I, I really love that interview with Casey. And I, I think she is a great example of how marketing and technical can coincide. Right. Um, but I don't know, even without uh, necessarily speaking the language, I mean, it's the, in my head, the way I always view it is like thinking in like layman's terms or when I was going through school, it was a, uh, if you can't describe what your work is to a high school senior, then you don't know it well enough to do it. Interesting. Um, okay. And so, and so I think that's part of it, right? Is if, if, if you know, and I, I think you're extremely knowledgeable at the glass industry. So the fact that you think you're not technical is uh, funny to me. <laughs> but, it's part of my self-deprecation. If, yeah. If, if you know it well enough and I, you know, you do, cause you put out your blog every, you know, every month or, and you see it and you think, okay, well, um, if you could describe it to a point where everybody that reads it has a general understanding of what you're talking about, then it's more likely to pique their interest, right? If I sat here and only rambled about, you know, the chemistry of it all or the like micro mechanics of the way everything works. And I don't think, I don't think anyone would really listen, you know, your brain kind of shuts off, but if you relate it to something that they know about or that maybe has impacted them, they're like, oh, now I'm willing to listen a little more. And so. Gotcha. That, yeah. that, 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 that makes sense. So, so, so I guess to, to, to start to wrap things up, you know, obviously educating people better technically is a big key, but what, what else do we need to keep doing as an, as a, as an industry and as a, as a, as a people to be better for this world? Oh, that's a big question. Yeah. Well, I'm, uh, I'm a big fan of yours. You can do this. Yeah. You can lead us. You're like, like a glass <laughs> Avenger here. You know, you're going to you know, be the one who's going to save us here. Um, yeah, I, I think, I think part of it is just making one, making sure that, I mean, obviously we're all kind of on the same page working towards the same cause. Right. Um, and you know, that, I think that's part of why I'm such a big fan of like, uh, NGA, FGIA, uh, ASTM. I'm, I love the idea of, you know, all of these big industry hitters working together and saying, no, we know this here. And this is what, this is what we are going to do, or this is what we are going to stand behind. Right. Um, I, I really think that's, that's key. Uh, some of the, I guess, in my opinion, most wasteful conversations have been ones where people start, you know, kind of talking through, like, I guess, arguing about like smaller nuances Mm -hmm. where like, Mm -hmm. maybe, maybe we just keep the big picture in play. Um, instead of instead of focusing on the minute details of it all because those are those will come and as as we progress but um no i think really it's advocacy it's um education and it's just pushing um pushing what we know i guess um and obviously being willing to learn and keep progressing um pushing for the adoption of new technologies and things like that. Uh, one of my least favorite things is though, but we've always done it this way. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I've that, given, that <laughs> I've given speeches that, that, you know, you know, Texas glass association, I think it was 2017, maybe that the, the title of my speech was that's the way we've always done it. Uh, and that's a, that's a glass industry staple right there. I mean, that's, 
And that's something we do have, we have to keep breaking out of. And I, 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 I preach against that constantly um, because we get caught in that, that cycle of, of, you know, not getting things done. And, and, you know, people make fun of us for moving as fast as a glacier. You know, we, we can't, be that way because we have great products we have great people you know i mean we we do have the answers um it, it's just trying to again get them out get them in front of uh of the decision makers and and keep moving things forward so uh yeah. sorry this was your interview not mine i just had, I had to go off there so this is a great discussion i'm i'm glad that i'm not the only one thinking like this uh you you are not alone. You are not alone. <laughs> the key is to to get more and more uh, folks like like you and I uh, thinking that way. And part of it is just our our structure as an industry. A lot of family businesses. I'm a part of one, you know, or or was a part of one, but I consider myself still part of one. And you know, th- you know, that knowledge is passed down from generation to generation. And you know, people are afraid to go outside of the box. And and then I do think when when we go up the 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 design ladder, um, architects and designers are afraid to take chances, especially in the U.S. You know what we what we produce over here versus what is produced in Europe and United Arab Emirates. I mean, they take chances, you know, you know, and and they go for it. We don't, and and it makes me somewhat crazy. You know, I will say one thing that I found is. uh, Whenever we we get a design spec and say, okay, this is what these are the parameters we need with your visible light, your solar heat gain, and your U factor. We need to meet these things. What do you have? And uh, the first thing I usually come back and say is, is there a reason why you're looking to meet these? You know, is it because of this is minimum for your energy, you know, energy code requirements, or is this? A lot of times it's oh, we just copied and pasted it from a previous spec, and they don't know why they need like. Yeah. So let's talk about what we really need, you know, right. let's talk about where we really are. And so, yeah, I think, you know, it, it is that, no, this is what we do. And this is, we just, I don't know. This will be locations. Let's, let's really talk about what we need. And so, yeah, I, I from the same perspective of, um, I, I think, I think the industry, the actual, you know, um, products have moved a lot faster Mm -hmm. um it's it's the adoption that is very slow and and just promoting like adoption of new new things and being willing to take those risks i think is uh important and i think that's something we'll continue to push uh at least from my angle and in the again with so many good companies and good people we have to keep pushing you know we've got great stuff adopt it push it use it uh it works trust it um, you know, you know, there, there are, you know, more uh, these and more of these, uh, absolutely. Definitely more of these conversations. I could go on and on with you. I, I, I that's for sure. I, I, I may have to have a part two with you because uh, you my mind is racing. Uh, but, uh, I, 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 I promised when I built this, this, this podcast that I was going to have three interviews and try to keep it in an hour, hour and 10 minutes. And I could go two hours with you just on, on my own. So, uh, I, but I have to ask you, my last question is, 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 Toledo, the first place you've lived outside of West Texas? Um, because I I interned in New York City okay. with the Doris for three months. And so I lived in I lived there for three months, but I don't think it counts because it was only three months. So otherwise, yeah. Uh, yeah. And and how's that compared, you know, because I, I live in Michigan. I don't live far from you. And so I know Toledo well. Uh, it, it's it's a it's a lot different than than you know uh, your six years at Lubbock or, or or where you lived in 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 West Texas area. Yeah, it's green. Uh, there's water. Um, my allergies hate it, oh, <laughs> but can... it's but it, I love it. Um, I love the fact that there are seasons. Yep. Uh, but when I first saw the leaves change color, I genuinely thought someone spray painted a leaf. Wow. Um, wow. So so yeah, I. I I think I'm still kind of exploring the Midwest, um, but I'm not, I'm not mad at it. Yeah. I like it. I like it. Well, good. Well, welcome to the Midwest. I know it's a, you've been here a while, but it's good to have you up here with us. And uh, thank you so much for taking the time. And I, I do think I may uh, have to circle back with you on a, on a few items because you, you brought up a lot of things that have my brain kind of going, uh, but keep doing what you're doing in, uh, in, in supporting this industry, doing great things for Pilkington, NSG Pilkington and the awesome team there. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time, and I hope I, I hope I'll see you at Glassfield. I know I know you're a busy person. Will 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 we get to see you in Atlanta? 
I will be there and we can meet in person finally. <laughs> that, that is awesome. I can't wait. So thank you very, very much. That is Dr. Kayla Natividad of NSG Pilkington, uh, architectural services, uh, technical engineer, uh, a big time volunteer through NGA, FGIA, AST, ASTM, you name it. She is out there supporting our industry and pushing for good things. Thank you so much for being with me. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Oh. All right, uh, thrilled for my next guest on, on the From the Fabricator podcast. I'm joined by Omar Malouf, CEO of Momentum Glass, and you can find them online at www.momentum-glass.com. They have locations uh, throughout the U.S., uh, Spring in Irving, Texas, so you know, you know that would be uh, Houston and Dallas, along with Nashville, Atlanta, and Austin. And uh, Omar, thank you so much for taking the time. I, I'm really excited to get to know you. I've been following you and Momentum online. And now this is like a, an exciting thing for me to, to you know, dig in and learn more. So thanks for being with oh, me. Thanks for having me, Max. Appreciate it. Awesome. So let's talk about you first. Uh, you know, as I did my research, you know, you didn't, you, you didn't, so much of us in this glass industry come from somebody in the glass industry. And, and unless I'm missing something, you didn't come from somebody within the glass industry. You were at Brown and Root and, and then you've now kind of morphed in and now you're, you're, you know, you're a glass pro, glass nerd, whatever the, the, the term is, but you're, you're with us now. How did you get to, to this point uh, and, and, you know, building up, uh, you know, uh, Momentum Glass? So I graduated college and I went to work for Brown and Root out of college. Uh, I spent two and a half years in the petrochemical side and then transitioned from the petrochemical side to the commercial construction side. I was a project manager on the construction of the Houston Astros baseball stadium. Okay. So I spent two and a half years doing construction, commercial construction. And I realized at that point, you know, it's a lot nicer to be able to show your kids something that you can do versus being in the petrochemical side where it's ethylene units and piping and it's just not a very glorious project or you know job so i uh i worked on the commercial side for two and a half years like i said and uh the glass company that did some of the exterior glass uh, on the baseball stadium asked me if i wanted to jump ship and be part of the glass business and so uh, i took that chance and i worked uh, 10 years over at another company and then decided, you know, it was time for me to try to do my own thing after that. So we've been almost 10 years. It'll be 10 years in September uh, at Momentum. But that's how I, I got into the glass biz. Yeah, I'm not, uh, I don't have a father in the business. I didn't come from PPG back in the day or right. Ben Swinger back in the day. You know, right. it's just uh, kind of learned on the fly, I guess, is the best way to describe it. No doubt. And, and, uh, and, and hey, you, you know, the way things are going, you know, people would uh, think that you've been in the business for 50 years. You've, you're, you're building a nice little uh, company there. You've got a, a lot of good friends in this industry. Uh, you know, uh, you know I, I, I mentioned that I was going to have you on the podcast to people and they're like, oh my gosh, how'd you get Omar? Uh, it was, it was, it was so, so only 10 years uh, on your own and 10 years before that, you, you, you're, you're definitely more of a lifer. Uh, and I did not know that the, uh, you were involved with Enron, which is now at Minute Maid uh, Park, which uh, uh, I had the, I, I got to go on that field, but when they still had the, the, um, the hill out in center field. Oh yeah. And, and yeah, Tal's Hill. At Tal's Hill. And, and, and TV does not do that justice. That is, that was a hill. Yeah, yeah, was, yeah, no, you could see some of the baseball players trying to run up there and fall, and then you realize how steep that little hill really was. So, no doubt, but yeah, it's, it's you know, I would like to say that I've tried to keep a, a good reputation and I've tried to, you know, do what I say and uh, say what I do and, and, you know, just do the right thing. So, I think that, that in doing that, I've, I've created some, some good friends in the business along the way. So, I, I believe in that wholeheartedly. No, no doubt, no doubt. And what's interesting is I started this business in 2011, in July of 2011. So, so I was a little ahead of you. And it was my brother who said, Hey, dude, you know, bet on yourself, you know, you know, do, you know, go, go off, you know, you can do this, you know, you know, a lot of people in the industry, you know, you, you can make this work. What, what was the driving force for you betting on yourself uh, in, in starting momentum in 2011? Oh, man, I just, uh, that's a great question, Max. I think that there were some things that happened at a previous employer that I just said, you know, it's time for me to bet on myself. I don't want to get into too much of those details, sure. but you know, you, you just feel there's always a time when it's, it's time that 
you, you need to grow. You need to expand your horizons. And you need to take the chances. And um, I just felt like I was at a point where it was time for me to do my own thing. And um, I have very, very much full confidence in my ability. Uh, some people say I'm a little too confident in my ability, which, you know, that's okay. Uh, I get that. But um, I had some had some partners in the business that, that uh, you know, some contractors in the business that thought, you know, maybe it is time, Omar, you know, we'd, we'd support you. And, um, you know, I just, I just took the chance. I had two young kids um, and I just felt like I could do it even with having, raising a family at the time. So we, we took the leap of faith, my wife and I, and basically she was a school teacher and we started out the company in a 500 square foot office uh, and uh, two, 500 square feet of office and 500 square feet of shop. Wow. And my wife was a teacher and she learned QuickBooks. And so she, she quit her job and we tried to cobble up uh, accounting and project management and shop fabrication out of 500 square feet. And we grew uh, out of our first shop in about seven months. Wow. We signed a lease in the next shop. It was 1,500 square foot of office and about 2,000 square feet of shop. We outgrew that in two years. We outgrew it the minute we moved in. Wow. But we, uh, we, we ended up staying for the three-year lease term. And then I ended up building my own shop. And, uh, you know, we built a, a shop that had uh, 12,000 square feet of shop space and 4,000 square feet of office. We grew a company year over year. We doubled in uh, revenue. Um, and so we took a little small mom and pop idea uh, and we built it up. And I will tell you, it's, it's, it's been great. And I couldn't have dreamed of where we are today. And it wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for some of the employees that, that basically had faith in what we were doing and joined me. And, you know, when you say team effort, there is no doubt that the guys that joined the company and that have been here since day one have created what we've done. It's not, it's a true team effort when you talk about momentum glass. Good deal. Good deal. And, and it is exciting how much you, you've grown. And, and so how do you though, you know, now you, you know, from, from 500 square feet of uh, warehouse space in, in 2011 to locations in Atlanta and Austin and Nashville and, and, uh, the, the original ones in Texas, how do you keep it from, you know, you know, spiraling and becoming too big? I mean, how, how that, that's gotta be a heck of a challenge for you. That's a great question. I would tell you, um, you know, in addition to, to where we are now, we built another hundred thousand square foot manufacturing facility behind our initial shop or our shop here. So what we've decided, you know, as a company was to try the hub and spoke method. You know, we're going to try to build everything in Houston and ship it out to the different locations. So we keep our quality, we keep our engineering team, we keep everything, our, our fabrication team, all centralized in one place so that we can see, you know, touch, feel, and make sure that the product going out is the right product. The other thing that we've been able to do is, you know, we've got a great team. You know, we've hired... Uh, people in Nashville, people in uh, uh, Dallas and Austin, um, they are quality people. You know, I, I try to hire a quality person, not somebody that may know everything in the industry, because we can teach you a lot of the nuts and bolts of glass and glazing, but it's the personal traits that make the difference. You know, it's the, it's the reputation, it's the, you know, just the quality people. So we've got some really solid people on the team. And then what we've also done is we've been able to relocate a couple of the homegrown talent that's been with me since day one. And they've relocated. You know, my operations manager in Nashville and Atlanta came from Houston. He packed his family up and moved over there. My ops director in Austin came from Houston. You know, he packed his family and moved up there. And so we've got, you know, a little bit of a mix of, of talent that's homegrown that has relocated and the good quality people that we've found in these locations. So it's a mix, you know, a good mix of our culture. Nice. And, and I think that's, uh, you know, it, I see it a lot on the fabrication side. F fabricators, you know, will open up multiple locations and, and then has it replicates its struggles. Uh, and I think you controlling it by the hub and spoke, uh, you know, you guard against that. And also, you know, uh, you know, having some folks uh, on your team that are willing to relocate, that's, uh, that's a big step. So, uh, I, I think that uh, that's For probably sure. why it's working. And uh, I, I, I meant to ask you, and I didn't have it on my initial outline. How did you come up with the name Momentum? That's interesting. We, 
honestly, it was, it was an idea that was passed to me by one of my developer friends. Okay. You know, I had different ideas and we were having cocktails somewhere and, you know, he's like, look, those are all generic. You need something that's always moving, always moving forward. You know, something that has momentum to it. It's like momentum glass or, you know, it, it was momentum exterior systems in the beginning. Okay. And we've changed it to momentum glass, but you know, momentum the key word of always moving forward always pushing that's that's where that came from it's a friend of mine that was a developer and and i liked it and he was right and we took it and ran with that and, and I, I assume somebody uh, said to you Mo momentum exterior solutions stands for mess and you don't want to be associated with being a yeah mess. it was a few things it was <laughs> mess and it was you know we, we were acquired in 2017 uh by a, a, an equity group um, and part of that was was to rebrand and, and to do mm -hmm. a different logo and change the name, clean it up a little bit. Um, and so, you know, our logo, if you look at our logo, there's yeah. an arrow inside the moment, the M. And, you know, you got to look for that, but it's there and it's pointing up. So it's always going forward. And so, uh, yeah, doing a little rebranding helped uh, clean up the, the exterior system to the um, just momentum glass. Good deal. Well, let's talk about one of your projects. Uh, you had sent me Rice, I assume Rice University, or is this a different sort of? It is. is no, that... it's Rice University. It's the uh, the craft hall. Um, okay. And, you know, this, this there was a lot of projects we could have sent you. And, you know, we've got some projects that are 25 and 30 story buildings, and we've got some smaller buildings. But I pulled, you know, two or three of my key members in the company. And I said, okay, somebody asked you what was the project that you're most proud of you know it'd be easy to say the biggest ones but we went with this one and and this one there's a lot of, of history behind this max you know we we developed our own unitized wall system for this project okay. um we developed it we tested it and frankly we failed our first test because we didn't do the work correctly and so we had to retest it um, we also were in the midst of expanding our facility to 100,000 square feet. Um, we also were buying new equipment. Um, we, we took on so many different challenges outside of just the scope of the work of the building itself. So you're going through you know, construction of a new building, you're going through training of equipment and how to use the equipment correctly, the programming, you're going through testing of the system, you know, retesting of the system. Um, and you're all doing this on a schedule where, you know, you're expected to perform at the highest level for Rice University, which great expectation level. So we made a lot of mistakes on this job. And if you look at the project, you know, you'll see that this has a little bit of everything, not a lot of one thing, but a little bit of everything. Yeah. You've got a unitized wall. You got a unitized wall that has a custom face cap. You have a unitized wall that has um, stripes in the glass. And so your stripes have to line up and make sure that the bottom unit and the top unit stripes line up. People don't think about stuff like that when you're bidding this, this type of work. Um, we had to cut all the dyes, do the testing. We also had sun shades that attached into the unit wall. You had all the exterior metal panels on the project we did. So and they were all custom perforated panels. So you had a custom perf panel, you had ACM panels, you had unit wall, you had striped glass, you had sunshades. I mean, you had, it, it was everything gingerbread you could put on a building we had on this project. And we had to do it with, while building the shop, while yeah. learning about how to do the unit wall. You know, it's just a lot of stress and a lot of, a lot of mistakes on this job. And it was the first project that we didn't make a penny on. As a matter of fact, we lost money on the job. And, but it, it really, it really, um, it really tested our core values. That's what one of our team members said. You know, it's like we came together, we, everybody strapped up their boots and went to work. Everybody pulled their weight and some, everybody went through the, shenanigans of, of the testing and the new job and the schedule. And, you know, on top of all of that, you had a courtyard scenario. So you not only had the exterior skin of the building, but you had another skin on the inside. Right. It was, it was the toughest project I've done in probably 20 years. And it's not a huge job, but it was, it was something that everybody in this company, to a T that I pulled, that's the project they wanted me to talk about. 
Wow. Well, that, that is the, it sounds like the ultimate blood, sweat, and tears project uh, at every turn, at every turn. Every time we did something, we got kicked, you know, and we just had to keep fighting through it. So it was, it was the toughest job in 20 years that I've done. And I've done some, some tough ones. Sure. You know, you had a consultant out of New York. Um, you know, you had a, a, a very well-known, reputable general contractor in Houston. Um, and it's for Rice University. You know, it's a, it's a showcase project. And we just kept making mistakes after mistakes, but we fought through it as a team. Uh, we got through it as a team and, and we bettered the company um, because we learned a lot. We learned how to do things. And, and you know, you, you see who your teammates really are when you're in, in battle like that. And it was, it, was a, uh, it was a defining project for us. And that's why we wanted to share it. No doubt. I appreciate you sharing it. And, uh, you know, folks who are watching this on the YouTube feed got to see it. Uh, and, and if you are listening to this, uh, make sure you either, uh, you know, go to momentum-glass.com. I'm sure you can find it up there or uh, check out this podcast on YouTube. But uh, I'm with Omar Malouf, CEO of Momentum Glass. And, and I, I mean, I give you a heck of a lot of credit. That's the, the resiliency is such a staple of of, of, of what you've been able to accomplish in your career. And, and this, I, I love that that's the project you picked the ultimate resilient project for you. Yeah. We could have picked some easy cupcake projects. We could have picked something that was a lot bigger. That was a bigger showcase, but you know, again, it's to the team, the team yeah. wanted to talk about the toughest, hardest project that we had that, that was probably the most unsuccessful financially, but the most gratifying internally. And that, and that was that project. And, and I like that you mentioned core values. We have a mutual friend, Tom Nesbitt, and Tom lives off of seven core values. And, and I assume you guys do the same because you're obviously pointing to it. Um, you know, and that's probably, you know, what helps keep you, keep you sane during tough jobs like this. It does. And, and I will tell you, you know, um, a lot of what we're trying to do is learn from Tom and, and from the peer group that I'm in. Um, you know, even developing core values, part of, you know, growing this business as fast as we grew it with making the mistakes that we've made, you don't think about initiating core values and a mission statement and some of the things that your company and your employees can hold dear. So these are new things that we're working on, uh, you know, the core values and the mission statement. Yeah. And, and you don't realize that you have really lived by something and worked by something your whole time. Now that you put it down and you're trying to promote them, you're like, well, we've done this the whole time, but now it's something that's in writing, it's tangible, people can see it, and, and now you have more of the team building around that. And that's part of, you know, learning some things from, from Tom and uh, Tom Jackson at, yep. at Steel Encounters and some of our, our, our peer group friends. You know, I'm I've, I've trying to take in what I learned from them and, and implement it in our own uh, company here. And, and I think that you are, and I, I uh, Tom Jackson is... Uh, I don't know if he, if he gets full credit for this this uh, quote, but but uh, I, I heard him once say at a speech, uh, "Culture over compensation, uh, building that culture." And it sounds like you obviously you know follow the same thing there at, at Momentum with 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 team team team. Yeah, you know? very true statement by the way. I don't know if it's his or or, or if he gets, but it's it's very very true. Very cool. Very cool. So how, how is the rest of this year looking? Cause you and I may this year and into next year, you and I may disagree here. I, when I was at Texpo, I heard from a lot of folks that it was soft. Uh, Dallas and, and, and Houston were soft. Austin and San Antonio were busy, but Dallas and Houston were soft. Uh, and, and I, I think you're probably going to tell me I'm nuts. Well, I'll tell you, you're not nuts. I will tell you that, that Houston is really struggling from a new construction aspect. A lot of people see what's going on now, but that's been stuff that's been let out for a year, a year and a half. So you're right. seeing the, the, the product of all the work. Uh, Houston's been struggling. I think, you know, economically, you know, with the oil and gas market, it's just not fit where it was. And, and then you have COVID on top of that. And you have, you know, you have some struggling in Houston. And I would tell you the same in Dallas. Echo your statements with Austin and San Antonio. The growth in Austin is unbelievable. Yeah. Um, but for us as a company, you know, we're fortunate enough that that we relocated or opened different offices in Nashville and Atlanta, and you know, so we're able to to complement the the lack of work in Houston with some of the work in Dallas and Austin and other areas. So we're balancing out our backlog. Uh, so fortunately for us, we we pulled the trigger on on multiple locations. You know, early enough where we could get some backlog there to make up for lack of backlog yeah. in Houston. 
but but Houston and Dallas are are soft. Yeah, I would agree with that statement. Um, okay. Again, lucky we have some offices across the country to make up for. And you were smart enough too. one of the things that I, I've, I always preach uh, on, on my blog is, is, you know, diversification. So whether you diversify by location or you diversify by product options, you can't not be a one trick horse in, in, in business right now. You can't yeah. be. No. And, and I agree with you on that too. You know, when I started this, we were doing strip centers in school and people giggle at me because you're like, well, wait a second, you do high rise office. Say, yeah. But I, I started out, my first job was a door and a sidelight on a hack out. And I remember, you know, always saying to myself, look, if I ever get to being able to do big office buildings, I got to remember and compliment my work with schools and public work. Yeah. You can't strictly be a private guy and you can't strictly be a public guy because the ebbs and flows of both industries. So we, we handle the private work and we handle the office buildings. But we also do schools and, you know, uh, you know, small MOBs and whatever it takes to, you know, keep our team employed. So we're a non-union shop. So I've got, you know, 168 employees that I want to keep employed the entire time. Yeah. So, you know, if Houston is slow, we'll move some of those guys up to Dallas. If Dallas is slow, we'll move some of those guys to Austin. So we've always got the same core group of field guys working with us wherever it is. And, you know, sometimes it's not the high rise building. Sometimes it's the office, uh, you know, the strip centers in the offices, but we have to be able to pivot. And sometimes it's metal panels and terracotta panels and, and you know, call, Whatever exterior things we can think of help, we even go to the interior and do some interior stuff too. Right. So whatever it takes to keep our team working, that's that's our philosophy. Yeah, you, you get it. You get it. That's for sure. And so I, I've, I've, I've used a ton of your time already. So before I let you go, I got to ask you, you know, you, you mentioned, you know, you're in the heart of Texas. Uh, you, you know, I saw that you went to Sam Houston State. You, you, your, your college are national champions. You just won the, the FCS football national championship. Yep. I have to ask, you've got, you're, you're surrounded by Aggies and Longhorns and Cougars as well. You're surrounded by, you've got to be telling all these guys, hey, I'm a national champion. When was the last time you guys won a title? Uh, it, you, is, you, it is you, awesome feeling. I got to tell you, yeah, I'm glad you brought it up, Max. Sam Houston State University is tried and true to, to my heart. Uh, you know, I do a lot of things with the school. Uh, even some of my personal stuff is always orange and blue. Um, heck, I got a Sam Houston cup sitting back here. I drink out of every day. I, I love Sam Houston State University, and I really love the fact that we're national champions. And I get Aggies that I've got Aggies and UT, uh, you know, Longhorns that work here with me. And yep. it's the peacock feathers are strutting around right now because of the Sam Houston State University. So it's, it's you know, yeah, if you follow anything about Sam Houston or, or, or FCS, you'll know that we have been a very competitive football team but we just couldn't get past North Dakota state. Yeah. So they, they're the nemesis and it was great to see us beat James Madison and North Dakota state, two of the top tier teams. Um, and so, yeah, my friends and I, we walk around pretty proud right now. You deserve it. I, I, I that was the one thing I thought of, cause I know, I mean, <laughs> UT Austin people uh, and and A&M folks are, well, the Aggies are diehards. Yes, they are. The Aggies and Longhorns are diehards. So it's nice to have a Bearcat out there strutting stuff for sure. Uh, I love it. I love it. Congrats to you and congrats to the team. And uh, I, I love that you you have that chance to talk a little, a little, little trash on those folks there. So sure, for sure. I, I love it. Well, I appreciate you taking the time today and, and doing what you're doing in the industry. You make this industry proud. Um, you know, again, the whole story, everything that you've been able to accomplish uh, is incredibly impressive. Uh, I don't know if you're going to be able to make it to glass build in September. I hope to see you there and, uh, and, and, and great and great to meet you in person, but you know, keep up the great work and thank you so much for doing this today. I appreciate it, Max. Thanks for your time as well. Keep up the great work too. It's great to have a visit with you. Thank you. Thank you. Glass build America is back. Goodbye. Virtual shows. Hello. Real products, real people and real business opportunities. The industry is reuniting at the largest glass, glazing, window, and door event in the Western Hemisphere for the buying and business building that only an in-person trade show can deliver. The leading commercial glazing contractors, glass fabricators, and residential fenestration manufacturers and installers are heading to Atlanta September 13th through 15th for Glass Build America, the Glass Window and Door Expo. Strengthen your supply chain and get the tools, products, and resources to future-proof your business. Your competition will be at Glass Build. Will you? For more information and to register, visit glassbuild.com.
Okay, to wrap things up this month on the From the Fabricator podcast, I am honored and thrilled to have the one and the only Andrew Herring from the National Glass Association joining joining me. He is the leader of the Glass Nerd Nation and uh, just an all-around great guy. And Andrew, thank you so much for jumping on the podcast. Oh, Max, as always, you're, you're, you're way too kind. Thank you. Happy to be here. Awesome. Awesome. Not sure I, why I fit in here, but I'm, I'm here. You fit in well. And that's the, the, the thing is, is I've known you for a while, but I, I don't know you that well. And, and so that's why it was really exciting because I've known you from, from the business standpoint. I've known you from getting the honor of working with you at NGA uh, and, and sharing glass build and so on with you. But getting to know you, like, for instance, like my first question was, how, you know, did you ever think back when you joined CRL in, in 2009 that you'd be the leader of the Glass Nerd Nation and, you know, 10 years later that people would be like following every post that you have on LinkedIn? Well, well hang on. Let's set some parameters. Is this, <laughs> a, hit, is this a hit piece, Max? Yeah, yeah. No, I promise. I will make you look good. So let's back up. How, how did you get into the glass business? How did you get, yeah. you know, how did you find your way to CR, CR Lawrence? I'm having legal review this before this publishes. Um, <laughs> I, you know, it, it was by accident, you know, I, unless you're kind of a glass brat or, you know, kind of your, your daddy and dad, did it, you know, most of the folks I know and talk to didn't really anticipate kind of ending up a, a, in this industry, but I, I kind of fell into it and then I, I guess fell in love with it. Um, I, I mean, going back, I mean, I, I went to school, I went to college, um, that wasn't the best use of tuition. Um, you know, I, I swung a hammer all through school. Um, I did construction, demolition. I, I think I was better at uh, demolishing things and building them, at least according to the boss. Uh, but so yeah. after school, you know, it was mandatory, you know, in order to complete, you know, I, I did like half graphics, half, uh, you know, half design, half business. Um, but in, for, in order for me to graduate, part of the curriculum at Cal State Fullerton, you had to attend this mandatory uh, job fair at the at the end of the semester. Um, so I did it. I didn't really take it seriously. I showed up. I, you had to sign up for at least three interviews. I slapped my name on the first three on the list, uh, one of which happened to be uh, KTGY, an architectural firm and planning company based out of Irvine. They're in Denver also. They're up north in California. Um, they're, they're big, heavy on the residential side. They, they mix it up now. So I, I just ended up, they, they liked what I had to show um, I phoned it in a bit, but, uh, ended up connecting with them. Uh, I started there just on kind of doing their, their marketing and a lot of their graphics, just, you know, submittals, uh, presentations for, for city hearings, things like that, planning commissions, all that boring stuff. Um, but then it kind of opened my eyes. It turned me on to some of the other avenues or aspects of the industry. You know, I ended up just, I, I wound up, started writing specs for them, doing different things I here and there. Did not know that. Yeah. And then uh, from there, you know, and right there, I had exposure to C.R. Lawrence. We had one of those big, goofy red catalogs there, um, just on the hardware side, railing side. So, I mean, there was some familiarity there, but I wasn't definitely, my mind wasn't going there. Uh, from there, you know, we'd get into doing these big developments, um, big master plan communities, shopping centers. And so we'd work with branding companies and environmental wayfindings, which is kind of just the nice way of saying, you know, fancy, expensive signage. Right. Um, and so I, I transitioned into a design build company there from KTGY, JB3D, also in Southern California. Um, and then again, still, still primarily my, my reason to exist there was more on the design side. Mm -hmm. uh, but then just being there and having, you know, just right across the wall, having access to the fabrication floor, you know, I got more familiar and more kind of entrenched in how things are designed and built. And so from there, I learned how to do shop drawings and I was uh, much more involved in, and kind of that, that still kind of thread running through it, that connective tissue is that we still had CRL catalogs there, yeah. um, the hardware, a lot of standoffs, anything you could imagine there. Um, you know, and I always had a, a buddy that I've known for, for a long time. Uh, he had worked for CR Lawrence. He had been there for, for a while and had found success there. And for, for there was always, you know, kind of, he would always kind of, you know, buzz the tower with me a bit and poke and prod. You got to come to CRL. You got to come to CRL. And I, you know, I said, there's no way in hell I'm going to Vernon. Um, you know, at that time, you know, I, I, it was, it's a drive. It's, you know, a commute. Um, and it was, it was not appealing to me at all. And so, but you know, every, every six months or so, just, you got to come. And then finally, uh, he, he said, look, just come. He said, Mr. Freeze wants to meet you. And I didn't know who Mr. Freeze was. Um, but I, I said, all right, I will come and I will listen kind of as a courtesy, as a friend, 
as you know, just I, I will go. You know, if, if they're if they would like to meet, I'm I'm not too cool for that or anything like that. I just really wasn't a fan of the commute. Um, so so yeah, so I, I went there, and and that's pretty much what what sealed the deal. Um, you know, uh, Don Freeze, Mr. Freeze, if you know what's good for you. Uh, you know, he took the time. He he met me. He listened to me. I listened to him. Um, sure. Really, really it took me aback. Really impressed me. Um, you know, this this multi-million now billionaire CEO of this empire. You know, he took he he took time to meet me and nobody. Um, and he he walked the whole floor. I mean, we're we're talking half a million square feet in, in Los Angeles. He he took me out on manufacturing, and he knew everyone's name. Um, right. And just engaging, interacting with every person, you know, the, the big guys, little guys, men and women, every, you know, he, he was really involved in his company. And, uh, you know, he, he dropped a line on me that, that I, I, I remember to this day, and it's really what sold me, you know, he said, it's CRL, it's, it's still America, you work hard, you can go places. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see what you can do, kid. And I said, well, I, I'm not, I'm not working here, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so yeah, it, that that was pretty much it. I mean, I was I was very impressed, and um, that you know, I he gave me a shot. I started um, lower level. I mean, it, it I took a mini step backwards just with kind of the expectation or the promise of up. Um, I started in the advertising department, and then opportunities, and I, I ended up working my way up to the the VP gig. Um, right. I stayed there for for a good a good tenure, and that's. It's not it's not a romantic story. It's not a fun, inspiring one. You just kind of you you go, you follow opportunities, and you know I'm I'm a people guy, and that I I'm impressed and and follow the right folks, I guess, and that was a, a great move for me, and it's been great for my family, and I wouldn't know how the heck to get out of the glass industry at this point. Yeah, you're you're at, you, well, as everybody says, once you get in the glass industry, you never get out. So, uh, and it's great that we have you, and and I did not know in in all this time we talked, I did not know you wrote specs. Uh, it's, so that's interesting because you do have you do you Is get along with specs. No, but you get along better with architects than I ever have. So I, obviously you had that flavor within you, you know, and and uh, and and so I did not know that. That's uh, that's something I, I learned already. So that's a good good start. And uh, obviously it's funny thinking about it back then to now. You know, the Mister Mister Freeze wants to meet you. Uh, or Mr. Freeze wants to talk to you. I mean, back then, like you said, you, you, you wouldn't know anything, you know, anything different. Nowadays, if, if I got that phone call, hey, Mr. Freeze wants to talk to you, I'd be, okay, got to gotta go. <laughs> got to go oh, talk yeah, to that's, Mr. That's Freeze. The, the, the bat phone's ringing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that, that's, that's, that's neat. That's neat. Well, that, that's, a, that's a, a cool career path. And I mean, obviously, you, you get to CRL and it's, it's just such a, you know, it's got everything under the sun. And so you were able to learn so much about the industry. And, and uh, I love the fact, you know, one, you know, of the many things that I admire you for is you have just such an amazing passion for this industry uh, and, and for, for the products and the people. And I mean, you know, you would think that you've been in it 50 years and, you know, you, you know, you were uh, the first person to hold a glass cutter with your enthusiasm for it. And uh, <laughs> I, I, I love that. I, I love that. Uh, but now, you know, you've moved on, you, you've come to NGA where you're the VP of business development, which is a, it was an awesome move to, to bring, you know, someone like you with your energy and your desire into, into the, uh, you know, the North America's largest trade organization, glass windows and doors. Uh, and how is that, you know, how has that been from a standpoint of working for a company versus now working for a trade? It, it, there's got to be goods and bads on both, I assume. Oh, it's, it's wild. Um, yeah, no, I only seem like I'm seasoned just because I, I age fast, Max. You know, I'm I'm only 22, but I look, you know, 60. Uh, <laughs> we've we've had this conversation about about other folks. No, you look your age. You you look good. You, no, you know, at 34, well, 35. Yeah. I don't know if that's good or bad. I'll, I'll yeah. never tell. I'll never tell uh, there you go. Inappropriate, Max. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Uh, we talk about age on this show. You know, my brother picks on me because I look like I'm 90 most of the time. So. I'm getting a lot more salt in my pepper and uh, yeah. that's helping me. I'll, I'll leave there it. You at that. There you um, go. Yeah, no, I mean, the, the, I mean, it's, it's been, I mean, you talk a seismic shift. Uh, it's, it's been big. I mean, the difference, you know, it was a comfortable move um, largely in part to just uh, Nicole Harris. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I knew her and got to know her just through my experience through CRL and through the association being a member advertiser exhibitor. Um, so, I mean, that, that made it a, a safer leap or I guess a more comfortable, I guess a viable one. You know, I, I don't know that I would have done it um, under different terms um, without her as that conduit. 
Um, but I mean, it's, I mean, you, I, I'm competitive by nature, almost mm -hmm. to a flaw. I mean, it's, I mean, if you did, it, it lends itself almost dangerously to, to the for-profit sector. Um, you know, I, I thrive in that, you know, I, I like planting flags and grabbing bigger pieces of the pie and all of those other those isms. Um, and so I, that's been kind of a different mentality. Um, you know, I'm kind of, it, it's working different parts of your brain and kind of taking off that, that competitor hat and kind of thinking bigger picture, yeah. you know, that, I, it's, you know, as an industry, it's, it's, you're, you're looking, you know, collectively more so than, you know, for selfish reasons, you know, it goes a lot further beyond, I guess, that, that transactional component, um, that everyone's just hell bent on, you know, obviously we all got to eat. Um, but, you know, I, I just getting, getting exposure to so many different avenues that I didn't, you know, as, as big as CRL is, it's, it's still narrow in scope in terms of what it's designed to do and why it exists. Um, and, so getting to getting to mix it up with the floaters, a lot of more of the fabricators, you know, much more on the residential side. There, there's whole little universes within this this bigger world, or more worlds in this bigger universe that you know I, I kind of had blinders on to. And so right. I, I mean, one of the biggest takeaways is just the ability to interact with folks. And you know, in that competitive zone, you know, it, it's you you don't really get the opportunity to engage or collaborate with with people. It's just it you just simply couldn't. It's it. There, there's different companies, you know, if they're right. competitive, I, I have all the respect in the world, you know, game recognizes game. And I, I would have loved to have had conversations with them or share ideas or bounce stuff off of. And that, yeah, that just wasn't, that uh, wouldn't have, wouldn't have played well. Um, and now I, I kind of have access. I got, I got the, the golden ticket or the, the key to the city to just kind of go walk into any shop, talk to any company and really, you know, just conversations and that that would have been possible and so and uh i, I guess you know I, not, not to sound too self-aggrandizing um you know you, you feel like you're part of something bigger um right you know? and that, that's i mean that, that's i don't know if that's try it or sounds sappy but i mean I, I, I'll, I'll back that if anyone has an issue with that statement <laughs> no no I, and i like i i like the, the the zest uh that you take when you get to go to places like i know in texas you got to go you know, and, and see the, the guys at Sharp and you got to go see Thad Ziegler and, and walk through their facilities and see it. And, and I mean, I, I love to do that myself. And I think that's, that's great. And you're right. When you're, when you're in a position like you're in, you can go pretty much everywhere because you don't compete. You're on, you're on everyone's side uh, in, in this deal. So that's good. That's exciting. Yeah. Well, once people figure out what the hell this guy wants, you know, I mean, I'm just a big fanboy at, at times, you know, like knocking on doors and saying, Hey, you know, can I come check it out? And it's, it's first, the question is why? right and then after a couple of explanations and then said oh yeah come on in i like it i like it so talk talk to me in in the audience about the importance of of nga because i think that sometimes it gets lost in well nga is just the group that puts on glass builder nga is just the group that's behind the magazines like window and door and and uh glass magazine i mean so but it's so much more than that obviously uh yeah i mean that, I, I like i like the tea up so i'm gonna Knock that one out. Um, there you go. Uh, yeah, and you know, and I've, I've been guilty of, of kind of the, the same assumptions too. You know, I mean, I think NGA is is in pockets. Audiences, you know, it's it is the publications, the it is the Glass Build America, it is the BEC conference. Um, it's it's it, it exists in all these little areas it's education it's the code stuff it's the you know the technical um uh conferences but you know the, the big picture is you know it exists to really level the playing field um that's that's what kind of gets me interested it uh it, it gives it gives a voice to to the little guy i mean it, it really it gives an opportunity for a lot of like-minded folks to kind of come together you know i don't want to be redundant but you know really stemming off of that you know that non-competitive side you know we, if we get way too busy, you know, just chopping down trees without, you know, seeing the forest for the trees, you know, we're all going to be in trouble. And so kind of just bringing folks together that, that need to keep that, you know, keep the glass in buildings and, you know, keep the industry alive and a thriving one and a viable career path. I mean, that, that's where it's at. I mean, it's, we, we tackle big things uh, more so than just, you know, focusing on, you know, your business book for that month. And that, that's, that's what NGA is, is to me. Um, it's, it's that opportunity for the folks that, that want to improve themselves or their business. And right. it's, it's a, it's a quick and easy path to do that. No doubt. And then, and then as an, you know, obviously as an obvious follow-up to that, you know, the, the biggest thing NGA does every year is glass build and glass build is more than just a, 
you know, more than just a trade show, obviously there's just so much to it. And, and you and I, you know, I'm honored to get to work with you on it. It's a, it's, it's one of my, you know, one of my two babies, you know, glass build and BEC are my babies in life. And, and, uh, I'm watching them grow what about the podcast, Max. Well, the podcast, this is number six, you know, uh, you know, we're, we're, it's, it's maybe, maybe growing into it, but the, uh, I, obviously the I live, renaissance uh, man yeah i live i live for glass build and for uh for for bec and so glass build's coming up and uh it, it's it's uh this year i think uh it's really exciting it's funny i was talking to uh tim finley who is uh one of the glass build ambassadors good guy uh even t finn he great great guy great rep in minnesota and he said you know if, if there's ever a year uh, that, that you need to be a glass build. It's this year. I'm like, dude, I love it. Please keep telling everybody that. And it's because, you know, we haven't been together in, in person for the most part for 18 months. And so there's a ton of excitement leading into the show in September, correct? I, I've heard, I've got a couple emails. I am aware of the show. Uh, no, I, I mean, you, Max, you know me. I mean, I, I get, yeah. I get paid to say glass build is exciting and awesome, but I mean, I, I've been a fan of glass build before I, I had to say, you know, it's right. I, I think as, as a whole, the event is, is really a spectacle. I mean, something to really be seen and be a part of, you know, I, I've seen it from every angle. I, I've mm-hmm. been an exhibitor. I've been a, 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 an individual attendee before now I'm kind of, you know, on the operations and the, the show planner organizer, organizer side, um, you know, and it, it's really just, it's something to experience um, for all aspects of the business. And so, I mean, glass build on a, on any given day is, is amazing. And this year, I mean, to agree with Tim and you, I, I think this is really, I mean, just, just kind of the hum, the buzz that's going on now. I, I think there's going to be something really kind of unique and special happening in September. Uh, like you said, the, the amount of time that's passed since we've been back together in person, like at that scale, um, at that, you know, all those different parts of that, that supply chain of this industry coming together for, for kind of the, the, the big show, the Super Bowl of, of the industry. Uh, it's it's going to be unique. You know, I it's been a month and a half. Shoot, I don't I forget how many days I, I started counting and then I just got sad. Um, but, you know, people, you know, you think you think these manufacturers, suppliers have been dormant or hibernating the last year and a half. They've still been iterating, innovating and producing yeah. and improving. Um, there's probably a lot of stuff out there that, that most folks haven't seen that they could put into practice in their shop, on, in, yep. in their business, on their systems, it, on the field that, that can really, um, I think there's going to be some big eyes. Um, well, I mean, plus everyone's just going to be excited to see each other. Yep. But I, I think there's going to be a whole lot of um, new product launches that, that I think is really going to be what's going to impress people the most. Just stuff, not having access to their reps, not having access to their technicians on the equipment they already own. You know, I think there's going to be a, a whole, you know, it's like my kids in school right now. They, they, they basically got held back a year just by default. And so they're going to get back into it. And just suddenly getting back up to speed, they're going to get smacked in the face with a whole lot of uh, new education and new content that just uh, you've been missing for the last year and a half. No doubt. No doubt. And that's why I think you, you know, I think you summed it up nicely. There's just so much going on and so much that has happened and, and just being able to get up to speed. And I'm, I'm a big believer in going yearly anyway, just because of the networking and the education and, you know, the innovation that breaks, but now, you know, more than ever after being locked up or locked down, you know, you, you, you need to see this and, and, you know, see what's out there, see what's new. And, uh, uh, I, I can't wait for September. And all right. So, so, so I, I was very curious. I assume one of these people would be Mr. Freeze, but who are, or were your business role models? And I ask really because you, you, you are to me, not the, uh, garden variety sort of guy. You're very, you know, you're a diverse, interesting guy. You have a lot of different tastes. You know, you're, you're not like that, that, you know, I, I'm just all into sports all the time, sports and glass industry. Like my dad, who was sports family and glass. That was it. That's a, he, th- mm-hmm. those were his interests. You have a lot of interest. You're into the, you know, you, you're a great supporter of the, the uh, women in construction efforts. You're a great supporter of so many other things that are going on in our universe. Um, you were like first on, on some of the eco things like ubiquitous energy. I didn't even know about them until you, you pointed them out. So stuff like that, who are, and were some of your role models business-wise that, uh, that you, uh, that you point to in your life? Ooh, heavy hitting now, man. Let's go back to the glass build. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you could just uh, say Mr. Freeze and get it over with, I guess, but. Oh, uh, well, I mean, that, that's, that's the easy one. I mean, I don't, I don't want to gush. I mean, I, I yeah. don't mind gushing. You know, I don't need to, to repeat, repeat, repeat. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, Mr. Freeze was, was definitely a, a major influence in my professional life, um, yeah. especially just in this industry. I uh, just, I mean, like I said, with, 
the association. I mean, he he's he's got a reputation for protecting the little guy. You know, mm -hmm. his any customer is a customer. It doesn't matter what volume or what scale. Um, that and just just his methodology. You know, he was really you know hire for character and then train for skill. Th those types of that that mentality is was was just key. You know, surround yourself with good people. Um, yeah, and he he always took care of his employees. It was you know there's. There's there's a couple of fable stories that float around that I've I've witnessed firsthand. You know there there's times where some people around him you know recommended him when he was doing a lot of traveling at the time. You know why don't, why don't you just buy a plane? You could buy a plane, get your own jet, and just go over. And his response was, well, I could I could either spend this and buy a jet, or I could employ this many people. And right. that that was he he understood the importance of a job to his employees, their families, and, right. and things like that. And so. He always did whatever he could to, to protect those folks. And in turn, you know, you end up with an insanely loyal staff um, roster of employees. And so, I mean, that, that component there, um, you know, my dad was a big one. You know, he had his own company. Um, he was a broker. I mean, broke his heart. He was in the lumber industry and I, I did glass. So right. we, we had some awkward Thanksgivings. <laughs> Um, I mean, he built it with his dad and his brother and, um, you know, he always focused on, on service as well. I think that's, that's, that's nice. a hallmark of any, any true entrepreneur or anyone that's really wants to succeed. I mean, you mm -hmm. compete on price that that's a dangerous slippery slope and a race to the bottom. Um, you know, don't, don't ever try to beat the price, just beat them on service. That, yeah. that was something that he always subscribed to. Um, and this, the, this will totally sound like an ass kiss move. Um, Pardon the language. <laughs> you know, N Nicole, I mean, I, I referenced it earlier as far as, you know, I wouldn't be in GA if it wasn't for Nicole. Um, right. I, I, I said it and I meant it. Um, you know, what the, the what she's done, if you, if you tracked her, her kind of trajectory um, in terms of her uh, history with NGA itself, what she's done in the last five years, even just for the association yeah. um, is is bananas. And then just just her drive, just constant improvements. You know, you're, if you ever think you're done, um, you're, you're going to. It, it won't end well, you know, she's constantly improving herself, um, the business, and that, that's admirable. I mean, just the effort she's making, like on the DEI side, stuff stuff that's probably uncomfortable conversations for a lot of folks in a construction adjacent industry or yep. organization. Um, she, she, she doesn't shy away. And so, um, yeah, I mean, those, I'd say those three are, are probably some of the most recent um, in, in my current role yeah. um, that's been, been good for me. No, they're good. They're they're good, and I I, uh, I give you a ton on on all of them. And on on Nicole, I can talk just from known her many many years. I've seen her in action both when I was a uh, you know a customer of of Glass Magazine or NGA, and then and then getting to be a consultant uh, in her world, and then eventually under her, uh, you know, working for her. Uh, you know, she she works on a different level, uh, you know, than than the rest of the universe, in my opinion. She's un unbelievable and. I mean, I, I've done things where I've turned in something to her where I think it's absolutely bulletproof and unbelievable and perfect, and it will come back. And what she marked up made it like a billion times better. I'm like, how? How did you? You know, it's just it, it amazing the way her mind works. So, uh, and, yeah. and 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 this won't blow. You know, this is because she doesn't. I don't think she t watches uh, any of my podcasts or reads any of my blogs. So it doesn't matter that I'm trying to to blow. You know, to 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 butt well, kiss wait here. Well, wait till she sees this name drop. <laughs> But but a very very unbelievable uh, and awesome person, and we're very lucky to have her industry wise. That's for sure, uh, and and good role models. Uh, and I, I love uh, I love I love I love what your dad says. And I and on the Mister Freeze thing, I, I think we should put together a quote book because I I've been living between. You know, he had a quote to me when I talked to him earlier this year about he never looks back. I don't look back. I only look forward. And that's been my mantra all all of 2021. I'm not looking back. I'm only looking forward. And if it works for him, it's going to work for me. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I, I love the, the the character quotes and everything he he said there. It's uh, oh, he's, he's you could you could fill a book. Uh, yeah. There's uh, you know, do what you're gonna do. You know, say, do what you say you're gonna do and and uh, improve it. I mean, that you know, that wasn't. I don't think that was originally attributed to him, but that was definitely an ism that, that he he's probably made famous. <laughs> yeah, no, that that works. Well, we may have to do that. We may have to do that. So. Last, last but not least, uh, what's got you energized about uh, our world for the rest of this year and then into 2022? From the Fabricator uh, blog, mostly. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate uh, that. <laughs> no, I mean, I've never been bashful about uh, my favorite part of my Sundays. Um, Thank you. You know, I, I like, 
you know, you, you mentioned energy. I, I, I like the energy. I, I love seeing the loud mouths out there, yeah. you know, like you, like me. I mean, what I try to be, you know, I'm, you know, I, I, I'm, you say influencer and that, that gets kind of tired quick, but you know, I, you, whether you want to call them an ambassador, you know, the evangel the evangelists out there, you know, the ones that are out there just, you know, they're, 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 they're shouting, they're defending, they're championing, yes. they're exposing yes. the industry. I mean, they're talking about it internally, but also kind of exposing it to folks that, you know, stuff that probably was never on, on your radar. You don't realize you're surrounded by the world of glass. Yep. And then, but the folks that are out there really, you know, they're doing it on their own time and just, just talking about it and celebrating it. That, that's, there, there's a few folks out there that I, I like. Um, and that, that's what I like to see. Cause that kind of, you know, I, I, I think it's, um, it's, it's contagious, you know, and it's yeah. reciprocal, you know, I see it and suddenly I'm amped, you know, I, we all kind of feed off of it. And so, yeah, I think it just kind of exponentially just kind of compounds and grows. Yeah. I, I, and I'm with you on that. I, th I, I, I think for, for me, the, the, one of the best parts has been the way that uh, LinkedIn and, and, and in some parts, Twitter have uh, uh, allowed us as a community to communicate more and bring more energy and, and, and more, excitement to our, our world, you know, and, and uh, that's something that was missing a couple of years ago. And now I think it, it, it's helped us ramp up, you know, ramp more things up in those influencers, those champions, whatever, whatever you may call them. It's, you know, they are getting the word out, which is what we need. Give me, give me your top three. Top three overall. In you remember seeing in the last two days. Oh, well, I mean, Keith Dobbin. Well, just that you've seen, like the content that you've seen. Well, any anything from Keith Dobman always catches my eye because of of his look <laughs> and his voice and his his passion. Uh, obviously, the glass build baseball cards uh, it, uh, were were are fantastic. I mean, seeing 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 the the faces on on the bodies and just the promotion of it and 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 so on. Uh, that that always goes. And then and then I, I mean anything that John Wheaton does, but this one was the 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 post that you had up with Hank Haney uh, for oh. Jeff Haber. You know, I mean that that blew me away. And and Jeff, Jeff, I know you know is 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 pretty low key. I know he had to be impressed with Tiger Woods as coach giving him tips. That was so cool. That was so cool. So yeah, things like that. The, the, absolutely, I can give you more and more. But those were the top three off the top of my head. Anytime Keith is on your baseball cards, and and uh, obviously uh, you know Jeff Haber's uh, shout out from Hank Haney. Good stuff. Nice. I love it. Good, good stuff. Good stuff. And and then I don't think we can end. We, I, I've been honored. I work with you full disclosure. I work, you know, National Glass Association is a client of mine. I get to work with you. Uh, we also have a, a, a person that we both get to work with Melanie Detmer, who's new to the NGA. Uh, and we, I have to say hello to Mel because she deals with both of us. So Mel, you know, we're thinking of you, you're not here with us on the podcast, but we're, 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 we're bringing you in this way, like almost virtually, right? Mel, first, we're sorry and thank you. <laughs> exactly, and she'll she'll get a kick out of this. I, I know she'll. Uh, Mel, Mel's a rock star. Has been yes. a phenomenal addition to to NGA, and yeah. hopefully she keeps putting up with uh, uh, Max and mind uh, antics. It's all about that energy. She's another one with great energy, and uh, we're very lucky that we have her, and then so many other people that I know you get to work with on a daily basis, and I get to work with from a consulting basis. You know the. The, 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 a lot a lot of superstars in the N NGA universe uh, and so we're very very fortunate and it all comes together uh, this fall at Glassbuild and that's uh, September in Atlanta glassbuild.com to uh, sign up do you have do you have the magic code two things first yes. you mentioned we we've known each other a long time and yes. we sometimes worked together you yes. forgot to say we're friends we are friends. I consider you a very close friend. And and actually, the backstory is you wouldn't be watching or listening to this podcast if it wasn't for Andrew saying, hey, you know, I'm thinking about some podcasts. What sort of equipment would I need to get a podcast? And and that's what started everything. And the next thing you know, he, he pushed me over the finish line because I always wanted to do this. Uh, and I looked at it a few years ago and just was scared off. So thank you uh, again for getting me into this. But yeah, you're a good friend. And uh, I'm a big fan of of you personally and what you're doing with your, your, your wife and kids are all turning out wonderful because of you. So it's all good. I am just a mirror, Max. I, I reflect whatever awesomeness you project onto me, right. sir. <laughs> you're special. All right. I do have the promo code. I'm a man yes. of my word. Yes. I see that multitasking. tasking. I wasn't ignoring you. Nope. I'm I know. Just, uh, all right. We're going to go glass nerd. Okay. Go to glassbuild.com promo code G L N R D. G L N R D. RD. That's your code. Just put it in there, glassbill.com uh, on Andrew. 
be on the floor for free uh, and, and get to see, you know, 300 plus booths or more, you know, they're filling up every day, more and more people are coming into the show uh, because they want to reach people uh, and, and, you know, take it all in and, and get in front of, uh, get in front of people, especially with supply chain, uh, as tough as it is. I, I started the podcast today talking about uh, glass shortage and supply chain and, you know, glass build is uh, a great place to make sure that you're protecting your interests. That's for sure. That's for sure. So any, hey, anything else before I let you go, sir? Uh, no, thank, thank you again for having me on. This is a, this is a treat. Most people get tired of hearing me talk. So, Not me. Uh, I mean, I, I, you know, I could go on and on with you as well. I only kind of scratched the surface. I, 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 though I am, uh, I'm thrilled you shared what you shared. So thank you so much for doing that. And, uh, well, let's do uh, it. I got, I got time for a three-parter. <laughs> we, 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 you know what? I, I mean, all three guests on this podcast, I, I may have to bring back for an encore because all, all of you have been fantastic and, uh, we, we will, we will do that. But, uh, for now, who we'll, else is uh, on this, who else is on this episode? Uh, Dr. Kayla Natividad, because you know that I was going to probably blow up that nat last name, and then Omar Malouf. Uh, Kayla is from Pilkington, NSG Pilkington. Omar from Momentum Glass, and then you uh, wrapping it up here, and then uh, uh, and, three, three and wonderful. One of people. these things is not like the other, man. I hope you. I don't know if I should go first or last, but uh, I don't, I don't, I don't think I, I belong in those ranks. <laughs> I think, I think the three of you are pretty darn awesome, and I'm, I'm honored uh, to have you on the, on the pod. So thank you, uh, thank you so much. I look forward to seeing you per, in person in a couple months, and uh, appreciate you doing this, and appreciate your friendship. Thank you. Keep it up, Max. See you. Okay, that will uh, wrap things up. Quick, though, wrap up uh, after these great interviews. Once again, thank you so much to my guests, uh, Dr. Kayla Natividad of NSG Pilkington, Omar Malouf of Momentum Glass, Andrew Herring of the National Glass Association. You guys are the best. It was a, a blast. Thank you. Fun stuff to end. Uh, three things to watch. Most of you have probably watched them already, all on HBO Max. Uh, the Friends reunion show, fantastic. If you if you liked it when it was out, I think they set the standard uh, for unbelievable reunion shows. It was a blast. It was hilarious. Friends reunion show on HBO Max. Also, HBO Max, Mayor of Easttown. You may have watched it. It was the hot uh, drama. Kate Winslet, who is one of the greatest actors of all time, uh, is unbelievable in this series. It's strong. It's riveting. It's a, it's a good drama. And... Uh, you know, anytime a Wawa is mentioned, I'm into it. Uh, so I love that kind of Philly flavor there. And then last is a documentary on D.B. Cooper, uh, which uh, I, I've always been fascinated by D.B. Cooper, uh, the guy who hijacked the plane and got a, seemingly got away with it. We don't know. Uh, and this really was an interesting look at the crime and also several people that could be or could have been D.B. Cooper uh and survived it uh and and very interesting so all on hbo max check those out and let me know what you're watching and uh, i'll share it in the fun stuff here but that is it for this month again super long podcast but i really enjoyed uh getting uh deep with some of these folks good stuff next month innovators tech wizardry lots of good things planned for next month and we will see you then thanks for watching Oh, the music is stopped.